We all have our own fears. Whether it be something simple, like ghosts, the ocean, bugs, or more existential, like loneliness, death, and the lack of a greater purpose. But what about something you just cannot seem to feasibly understand? Not in the psychological sense, where you are afraid of your own mind's creation, but in the sense of being afraid of the lack of visual and mental comprehension of what is being perceived. The idea that there is something that completely obliterates your sense of perception and your sense of processing, something that shrinks you down and reminds you of your fragile humanity. That, ladies and gentlemen, would be cosmic horror. Cosmic horror is a difficult subject to talk about due to its need to have a lack of understanding. If cosmic horror is not a term you are familiar with, then Lovecraftian horror is probably one that you are. But how did this type of horror come about? Well, it all started with a man known as Howard Philip Lovecraft, who was born in 1890 and wrote stories throughout his childhood whilst suffering mental instability. I mean, what do you think of when you think of Lovecraftian horror? In the early 1920s, Howard began to publish the stories that defined a literary genre, but was he actually the first? If you look a little bit earlier, there was another novelist known as Algernon Blackwood who published The Willows and the Wendigo in 1907 and 1910. A lot of his work and ideas came after two trips down to the Danube River. When we went to bed at 10 o'clock, the full moon shone upon the white cliffs with a dazzling brilliance that seemed to turn them into ice. While the deep shadows over the river made the scene strangely impressive, only the tumbling of the water and the chirping of the crickets broke the silence. In the night, we woke and thought we heard people moving around the tent, but on going out to sea, the canoe was still safe and the white moonshine revealed no figures. It was doubtless the river talking in its sleep, or the wind wandering lost among the bushes. Blackwood was known for his love of nature, but after this trip, it's been reported that he saw another side to nature, a darker side that he couldn't explain or understand. So Blackwood advanced the idea of nature itself being an element of horror, and Lovecraft took it and expanded it on a more cosmic level. Your Call of Cthulhu and At the Mountains of Madness. When I think of Lovecraftian, I think of giant larger-than-life monsters, and I gotta say, it gets under my skin in the way I believe it's supposed to. That feeling of being so powerless to an unstoppable and enormous creature. It also doesn't have to be a creature, because sometimes we just don't know. I believe cosmic horror feeds into everyone's existentialism. The thoughts of an afterlife, what is among the stars, what is our purpose? In these cosmic horror scenarios, one would think there is no purpose, with the existence of such threats imperceivable to the human consciousness. Some really good cosmic horror examples sometimes get mixed under sci-fi horror when I believe some films deserve the better spot. Take Alien, for example. When you first get a good look at the xenomorph, you are able to conjure up a definition. That's an alien. Or, that's a creature from space and its only purpose in life is to kill. There's no reasoning or bargaining. Whilst this does apply to the fear of the unknown, there is still a sort of familiarity to it. It still works, however, as it still has a biological and naturalistic form we can recognize. Another good example, which I know I already talked about, but it is just too good, is The Thing. The Thing falls under body horror and cosmic horror in my eyes. A nice blend between the two where the creature comes from space and its natural form is never fully shown but only depicted in human and animal forms. This makes it all the more scary. The more familiar you are with the perceived threat, the scarier it's going to be thinking about what is truly inside them. And let me tell you, The Thing does not hold back in showing you. However, let's get towards the example I have been waiting to talk about, and I wouldn't be surprised if you have been waiting for me to talk about it. But here we go. Let's get into Annihilation and its perfect usage of cosmic horror. Before that, however, I just wanted to pop in here and say a big thank you to all the support the channel has been getting recently. I know we are in for some big milestones coming up, and it is all thanks to every one of you who subscribe and like and watch the content we're putting out. But let's get to what you came here for. Annihilation came out in 2018 and is an adaptation of Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation, who even said the movie was more surreal than his original work. Early reviews were calling this movie a modern sci-fi masterpiece and it was very well deserved in my eyes. The perfect understanding of cosmic horror and how to illustrate the idea visually to screen. You see, when you think about it, the whole idea of cosmic horror is just the fear of the unknown, but the idea of creating a story based around that sounds like a tough journey. How do you come up with something that does not have an answer, and is only up to visual interpretation? 
do you think the directors have these answers in mind, or are they playing alongside the rest of us trying to make sense of the unsensible? Annihilation opens up on a shot of what appears to be a meteor crashing down to Earth through a lighthouse. We immediately begin to follow Natalie Portman, who plays biologist Lena, almost a year after her husband Kane had disappeared on a classified military operation. She later finds him coming right back through the bedroom, but something doesn't seem right. He's quiet, and doesn't seem to be all there. Immediate red flag, as we were already under the impression that he had been missing for a year, and we already are making connections to what crashed from space. Her husband collapses, and on the way to the hospital, the military intervenes and takes both her husband and herself to an unknown compound. Lena is informed that this meteor that crashed to Earth created a bubble around the lighthouse that over time continued to grow and grow until taking up a good region. And the boundary is getting bigger, it's expanding. So far it's eating into barely populated swampland, which in a few months, the area will have grown to where we are right now. We learn that her husband went inside the Shimmer with a squad and he was the only one to make it out alive. Now we have Lena with psychologist Ventrist and three other scientists, Josie, Cass, and Anya. Right off the bat, we have a setup for a killer cosmic horror movie, but this film continues to take turn after turn. Once inside the Shimmer, things don't seem to appear the way they seem. The group wakes up and doesn't remember setting up camp or crossing into the Shimmer, but they had been there for a couple days already just had no memory of it. You don't remember setting up camp, do you? I don't remember anything after we reached the tree line. Each member is specialized in a different category, and so the learning process is so interesting to hear about. Except another interesting thing is you are presented with all these really intelligent scientists, and you've got a psychologist and a biologist who are all just confused. Nothing within the shimmer is making sense to them, and they drop a lot of, that's not possible, throughout the movie. Their first assumption is that these are mutations as there are plants growing different flower species and all other sorts of unexplainable life forms. Like I said prior, this film is very familiar with its setting, but it's breaking all the right rules to heavily confuse us and our way of interpreting the world and how life evolves and is created. Things that shouldn't be possible are becoming possible, and it is becoming more and more difficult for our characters to keep a level head in an ever-changing setting where unknown dangers can lurk anywhere. The danger could be from the wildlife that has been mutated as they fight off an alligator with shark teeth. A scene that is just so brutal is when they find a video camera and play some footage captured by Kane's team. They open into a guy's stomach to show that his intestines are all moving around as if they are alive themselves. Creepy stuff, and it's only the beginning of the terrors they face. One of the members gets absolutely yoinked out of the field by a huge bear, which once the bear returns, we learn that somehow during the process of the bear killing her, her vocal cords and mind started to cross with the bears, which creates one of the most unsettling monster and animal scenes I've ever seen in a while. Everything about it is against nature in its sickest ways. One by one, each member starts to get infected in some way by the shimmer. Cass gets taken out by the bear, and so does Anya after she starts to lose her mind. Ventress kind of vanishes off, and we get left with Lena and Josie. If I don't reach the lighthouse soon, the person that started this journey won't be the person that ends it. I want to be the one that ends it. Revealed to have previously self-harmed, Josie always walked through the shimmer with excitement as if she was always on the verge of a breakthrough. Josie and Lena have a discussion after Lena finds out that the shimmer has already been inside all of them. We learned earlier from Lena that the Shimmer is refracting the radio and microwaves while also refracting the DNA and potentially consciousness, like we saw with Anya later on. The Shimmer is a prism, but it refracts everything. Not just light and radio waves, animal DNA, plant DNA. Josie explains that she no longer wants to fight the Shimmer or face it, and after that we see as she leaves and plants start to grow out of her skin and turn her into a plant. This scene always stands out to me, because to me I see Josie being reconnected with life and the universe. She becomes a new life, and it's nice to think that she managed to ascend. In reality, however, it would seem as if her DNA and the potential radiation waves from the Shimmer began to intertwine and mutate her into the plants surrounding her. Once we reach the end, however, things start to get unexplainable. Lena finds her way to the lighthouse, where we see a skeleton and a video camera set up. 
What Lena watches is her husband Kane kill himself with a phosphorus grenade, while a clone walks into frame. We get glimpses of clones and duplicates prior like the two deer, but never a human. Lena continues to go down into a crater where we find Ventress in the corner, and it looks like her face is gone. However, when she turns, she looks regular again. Not too long, however, a big beam of light and particles come shooting out of her as she slowly flattens out and seemingly becomes the lights around the area. We see this weird, constantly shaping bubble form that after getting a drop of Lena's blood, transforms into a humanoid figure. This end segment is about 10 minutes of no dialogue with some of the most haunting music I've ever heard. But visually, it's just Lena and this humanoid figure copying her every move. She runs for the door, but it presses up against her and doesn't allow her to leave. As said by Lena, however, it only attacked her once she attacked it. It attacked you. It mirrored me. I attacked it. This completely destroys the idea of a motivation behind the shimmer or the alien, as we can also call it. The only thing to describe this cloud of smoke turned human figure is alien, but it still feels foreign to say it's an alien because even then it doesn't seem to fit the description because of how incomprehensible it looks. This whole movie is about attempting to understand something that physically can't be understood because it doesn't even have a real sense of understanding of itself. It appears as if the alien is learning from Lena, as if it came here just to gain knowledge of this everlasting system of life. We have some horrifying imagery with the bear and the alligator, but there is something beautiful about the nature and the environment. Everything is much more saturated and alive looking. It's a big visualization of nature in its most unexplainable sense. But why is this scary? Well, it's scary because our place in the universe has always scared us. Not just the universe, really, but our place in existence. Why do we exist? What else exists outside of what I can access with my senses? It's mentally deteriorating to conjure up thoughts of one's own existence and perception, and a big way to get someone to do that is to show them something bigger than the concept of thought itself. It's having your whole understanding of how the world works shattered in ways you couldn't have ever guessed. Knowledge we wish to forget, and sights we wish to unsee. If you remember earlier when we talked about Blackwood's two-time trip to the river, his explanations of his time there seem oddly familiar to some of the feelings we get throughout this movie. Only the tumbling of the water and the chirping of the crickets broke the silence. In the night, we woke and thought we heard people moving around the tent, but on going out to sea, the canoe was still safe and the white moonshine revealed no figures. It was doubtless the river talking in its sleep, or the wind wandering lost among the bushes. The river talking in its sleep, or the wind wandering lost among the bushes personifying nature and believing something is alive out there. Annihilation is one of the most perfect representations of cosmic horror I've seen in a very long time. It's hard to explain why, but it feels like one of the most realistic sci-fi movies we've had in a while. Yet at the same time, this movie is so unrealistic. Throughout the movie, these characters are associating the changes and the mutations they are seeing with the natural order. They are able to recognize that these are DNA changes in crossbreeding, Sure, they recognize that mutations to this scale shouldn't be possible, they still have a definition that they are indeed mutations. It allows the audience to follow along for the exploration process and feel engaged. The genius comes in as we slowly dismantle the mental state of our main characters after some things can no longer be explained. Annihilation is about self-destruction. Earlier on in the film, Ventress asks Lena if it is biologically coded within us to self-destruct. And if that was the case, the Shimmer would mess with that pretty badly. All of our characters had already self-destructed in some ways. Josie self-harmed. Anya had struggled with addiction. It's later revealed Ventress was dying of cancer. And Lena had an affair with Cain. Did Cain know about the affair? Is this why he went into the Shimmer in the first place? These are all the questions on Lena's mind. And if Lena feels it's her fault Cain went into the Shimmer, then she's going in too. Each of these characters only wanted to find themselves in the Shimmer, and I believe Lena and Josie are the only two that got what they wanted, and maybe Kane as well. In my opinion, the clone that is formed is a blank slate for a new state of being. The figure continually copies Lena's movement, yet when she tries to run, it runs after her and suffocates her down. Like people's own minds can when they try to run from things they are supposed to confront. This carbon copy is becoming Lena, but not really a clone of her, but a new Lena. Lena and Cain killed the parts of themselves that were self-destructed and ascended into a new state. 
We don't, however, have a full understanding of what this new state is for them, as they themselves are not too sure. You are okay. Are you? I don't think so. Are you Lena? Annihilation takes cosmic horror and shows us its most horrifying attributes, and yet its most breathtaking ones at the same time. The themes and ideas you're able to explore with human characters put into an abstract and unexplainable environment gives you a fantastic cosmic horror slash character story that leaves you really unnerved and confused by the end, but also with a sense of wonderment with what you got to see. So often we search for answers for everything and what could possibly be up above the sky, but we rarely stop to think if we are ever prepared for whatever unknown abstract being could be existing in such a way we never could have even imagined. <laughs>